Hello guys and welcome back to this episode. So today we are going to talk about La Belle Otero. Okay, so this story is a story that I just found out um, about and it's completely new to me, or it was completely new to me and I thought it was absolutely interesting, such a story that deserves to be told. Therefore, let's start. Um, let's start immediately and jump straight to her childhood. So she was born as Augustina del Carmen Otero Iglesias. So, you guys can guess, she was Spanish. She was uh, born in 1868 in Balga, which is like a poor, or it was a poor place in Spain, um, a small village, and she had quite the childhood, meaning very, very tough, very, very rough. Um, the shoemaker abused her when she was 11, and so um, she was brought to the doctors and then brought to nuns um, that tried to take care of her um, uh, scars and have her um, uh, wounds, right? The uh, physical wounds and the emotional wounds. Um, um, she escaped um, her torturer, the shoemaker of the village, um, um, yet that wasn't enough. Um, she um, stayed in the village for about another year and then she decided to leave. Uh, the only thing that she knew, and uh, uh, on this topic there's a whole um, um, argument that we can establish because basically, uh, you know, um, according to psychologists, and I'm thinking of Winnicott, I'm thinking about the book that I read on um, uh, when I was studying psychology, um, um, we can, um, we can uh, determine that there are in childhood and especially in the year um, in the years of um, adolescence there is the discovery of sex um, 11 is a little young but um, there's the, the discovery of sex and adolescence so teenagers um, are really um, in a very peculiar stage because they can appreciate the secondary advantages of prostitution, um, meaning the money. And um, they have developed the sense of good and bad. Um, but then I guess that all of that gets very messed up, um, very screwed up when you are abused. Um, and I guess also that when you are the second child of seven, like um, Otero was, um, then it all becomes more and more complicated. And anyway, she left her village, left her family, and uh, started roaming around. And in order to survive, she would sell her own body. So she became a prostitute. Um, that was her choice, maybe her destiny. Um, and she did that for a couple of years until she landed in this bar. Um, I think we are in Spain and I think we are also in Madrid maybe. And she landed in this bar and uh, uh, there there was a man uh, named Paco and um, she um, found um, a shelter. But Paco uh, made with her some sort of deal, some sort of agreement. Paco told her, listen, we stay here and I'm also gonna teach you how to dance. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you, uh, or I'm gonna make a dancer uh, of you. Um, but um, you will also provide an extra service and that extra service means that you will sleep with uh, the customers, with the clients that want to. And so they started off like that. She agreed, they started off like that, and um, she basically was a prostitute for everybody because at the beginning, when you start a career, you can't be selective. And so they um, would organize, he would uh, procure, he would uh, uh, set out, uh, arrange uh, all the stages where she would perform. Um, she was definitely like a very good dancer. Um, she was beautiful, and then um, that on top of dancing was very attractive, was very alluring uh, for men. Um, and so they started off from the most dirty um, stages, if you like, and then she went on and on and the stages become more uh, fancy, more elegant, more kind of classy. That was the deal. And that was the deal until Paco said, listen, um, I don't really want you to sleep with other people. Um, I have uh, fallen in love with you, stop this career and I'll just provide for you. But let's also 
uh, considered here Otero's side. Meaning, at this point, she was independent. She had outgrown Paco, and Paco was the one who used her. So, yes. Um, she was abused and yes, she made a choice, if you want to say that, um, to become a prostitute. I don't know how much of a choice uh, can really um, be mm, defined this one, in the sense that there are circumstances in which you don't really choose, choose. But anyway, she had chosen to become a prostitute, but then Paco took uh, further advantage of her by making her a prostitute. Yes, he told us something, but then she was the one who held um, hold the power, right? In that kind of relationship. So she declined and she left Paco when she met the new manager, um, meaning Jurgens. Now, Jurgens was an experienced theater manager. So he definitely knew what, um, what to do and how to hype her up. And so he hyped her up um, all across Europe and then in the States. When she arrived in New York, um, all the newspapers, all the public was highly um, anticipating her arrival and she could not fail. The expectations were impossibly high. Um, so she was uh, described as this dancer um, uh, and uh, her performances were described as extremely um, entertaining and luring and uh, performances where every single um, muscle of her body would dance along. Um, and therefore, that is, you know, um, the experience in the States, which was absolutely great. Then she came back to the States um, stayed for a little while in Europe, then she moved again to St. Petersburg. Um, in St. Petersburg, um, she made this uh, uh, kind of triumphal entrance. She was on a six-foot silver tray, um, and then she danced, she performed. Um, throughout this period of time, she would dance uh, primarily, and then she would sleep with the most uh, affluent, with the, most, uh, with the richest one, um, who would ask for her services. Um, and in St. Petersburg, the same things, the same thing happened, the same exact thing happened. Uh, so she entered, she made this entrance, um, she gained a, um, um, a piece of jewelry uh, that is worth like one million rubles in one night, um, just because of her performance. Um, and then she stayed for a little while in St. Petersburg, then went back to Europe, um, specifically to Paris. There, um, she went to two places. One, it's a um, more um, classy kind of um, bar where she could exhibit herself, and it is known as Cirque Det. Um, but yet, um, she was there for like a couple of weeks, no more than a couple of weeks. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, when uh, when she left that, uh, she went to the Bell Tavern. Now, the Bell Tavern was less classy if you like um, um, but um, very entertaining there was something called the fishing game uh, which is basically uh, which was basically a game where um, uh, men um, would pick the dancers um, with whom um, to dance and there she met Prince Albert of Monaco now one very important thing here is that in this meanwhile, Jürgens had also fallen in love with her and he had started like paying her out um, but yet again the money was never enough so, so he started embezzling the money from the theater and then he was gradually pushed away, right? Because after St. Petersburg, I think she realized that she could totally make this on her own. She could be her own manager. Um, and so she could decide exactly what she wanted to do, where she wanted to go, and she could arrange um, everything for herself. So she decided to go to the Bell Tavern and here she meets um, Prince Albert of Monaco and they became uh, lovers. They became lovers. Prince Albert uh, set out an apartment for her um, and so she was uh, paid for her performances, paid for her services, for her bedroom type of services and they, the two had a relationship. They had so much sort of relationship that Prince Albert of Monaco made at a certain point later on uh, public his feelings um, for her. But 
um, he didn't have the exclusive in this relationship because, for instance, she went for a three-day um, kind of vacation slash performance um, to Cairo, and there, for instance, uh, she slept with, uh, or allegedly slept with, uh, the viceroy of um, Cairo, and she earned um, another piece of jewelry that is um, worth half of a million francs in only three days. And then again, she meets somebody else that was Prince Nicholas of Montenegro. Now, um, Albert of Monaco and Prince um, um, Nicholas of Montenegro were the two actual companions of our life. They would also share the same, bed the same bedroom, but also the same apartment, the apartment that Prince Albert had set out for her. Um, they didn't have any issue, and also they rescued her a couple of times. They rescued her along with another guy, a guy that she met in Russia, in St. Petersburg, that was um, Grand Duke um, Nikolaevich. Nikolai Nikolaevich was also very important because uh, he was one of the three people who rescued her when she started having um, money problems. Now, the money, as you could guys see, was coming in without particular issues, right? But she started gambling. She started gambling a lot. It all started one night when she was able to turn 10 francs into uh, 395,000 francs. Um, and then from that on, she was basically very, very welcome by every casino. Um, every casino, especially in Monaco. So what happens is that when um, Prince Albert of Monaco made a statement uh, uh, declaring to the whole wide world that he had an affair, a relationship, um, an interest, a romantic interest in her. Um, the wife banned her out from Monaco, but then the casinos, one year later, uh, begged her to come back and please play in um, uh, in the in, in their casinos, right? But anyway, um, she did that uh, for a number of years. She was 34 when she was booed um, in um, Bologna, um, and then she was 40, mm, less than 40, but like around uh, her 40s, when the French public considered her too old to dance, too old to sleep with people, too old to do all of that, right? Um, and so she decided to change a uh, career. She went for acting, which was very successful, uh, but then she discovered her true passion in opera, um, in opera. Um, her true passion was singing operas and she was um, especially talented for doing that. She was able to sing uh, Carmen for a couple of times and she was only 43 so she had like quite the life um, until that point in time. Uh, from that point on it's kind of a decline because she was definitely too old uh, obviously, you know, there were other people in the field that were pretty much experts and, you know, they could dance better, they were younger, so she had a sort of decline in her career. Now, she could easily live out of her own money, but she would not because she spent basically all she had. So for seven years, uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich and Prince Albert and um, uh, Prince Nick. Uh, King Nicholas of Montenegro um, set for her an apartment where she could live, but even that wasn't enough. Um, and so um, they kind of provided her with the money um, and she spent the rest of her entire life living basically in a small apartment um, above a casino, playing basically every night and she was there you know, spending her money and, you know, kind of having a normal life. And she lived for very long. She lived until she was 97, right? Um, but she had this magnificent life, um, full of splendors, full of jewels, full of, like, meeting with rich people. But on the, on the other side, um, the dark side of this was all the uh, prostitution that was ongoing, right? Which I think she came to... And understanding herself and she came to live peacefully with, peacefully with that but it's interesting how all that glamour was then associated with something um, that we wouldn't like to do especially when forced so that was kind of the story so 
With that being said, guys, please let me know. Comment below. Let me know what you think about this story uh, about LaBelle Otero. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Comment below. Subscribe to the channel. Um, uh, leave a like and also um, hit the notification bell for um, receiving all the new videos. Guys, I'm going to talk to you next time. Bye!